So you've heard the claim, Jesus Christ is the source of abundant life. It's a pretty audacious, audacious claim to say he is the source. And he says it himself. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not a way, not a truth, a life. It means that Jesus alone is that answer to the question of every human heart, as St. John Paul II said. So how can we make that claim? In order to understand this, we have to go back to the most ancient story of the human people, the story of the creation of Adam and Eve, of, of human beings. And the story tells about God's relationship with humanity, how we walked with like friends in a garden. And in that story, he says, you can be in charge of everything in this garden, except you can't do one thing. You can't eat of the fruit in the center of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you say, well, why would God do that? If I said to you, if I said to you, listen, don't think of a pencil. What did you just think of? You thought of a pencil. <laughs> if you were on a diet and you hadn't had, you've been, been so good and I put a huge plate of hot chocolate chip cookies and said, would you just watch these for me while I go into the other room? You'd be like, uh, that's all you'd be thinking about. But is it a trick or is there something more of this story? You see, the story is really about the relationship between God and humanity. And God says, you can do almost everything in this garden, but you can't do everything. Because you know what? That's my job description. I'm the all-knowing. I'm the all-powerful. And you're the top of my creation, but you're not God. And just like in any love relationship, if you want to be in relationship, you have to be true to who you are. If you try to be something you're not, you can't be in love. You have to be honest. You have to be honest. This is who I am. So if we try to be God, and that was the temptation when the evil one, the serpent comes up and says, listen, if you eat of that fruit, you're going to be like God. And so that temptation, so they, they say yes. So the basic first rule is to this. If God tells you something and a snake comes to tell you something, <laughs> stick with God and not the snake. So they eat of the fruit and suddenly something happens. Suddenly, they have broken their relationship with God. Just like you, if anyone that you loved, if you had done something explicitly opposite of what they asked, that relationship would be damaged. And if you listen to the story, the first effect of that sin, that original sin, that breaking from God, the first effect is they realized they were naked and they were ashamed. It means the very first effect of breaking with God is we can hate ourselves. We can hate ourselves. We can look in the mirror and be like, ugh. Before they were like, hey, I I'm a child of God. This is the guy I hang out with in the, in the garden. And suddenly they are, hate. if I can hate myself, well, who else can I hate? I can hate everybody else. And you just look at all the, the, the bad things that have happened. They've happened because we broke that relationship with God. Where in the context, we, we knew we were loved, and so I understood that you were loved, and you were loved, and you were loved. But once that was gone, then I could suddenly say, you know what, if I'm going to be like God, then all those Jews need to die. I can say, oh, I can decide when life begins or life ends. Suddenly, we try to take control, and the results are disastrous. It's only when we're in relationship with God does, does the right order get back. And so... Just like in any relationship, if you, if you damage the relationship, if, if you, with your best friend, did something that hurt their feelings, you'd have to be the one that would make up for it, right? The friend could say, I forgive you, but if you're not sorry, if you haven't done anything, and in relationship to the, how serious the, the offense was, the hurt was, saying I'm sorry might not cut it. It might, you need to maybe go and bake a banana bread or do something, take them out to dinner or whatever it was. So if you listen to the Old Testament, if you listen to the Hebrew scriptures, you hear the relationship between God and the Hebrew people. This chosen people, his first building block of the salvation of the whole world. And we hear the story of their attempt to, to make right the break and their failed attempt time and time again. They try to build a tower up to heaven in Babel and suddenly all oh, they fall into chaos because they're trying to be God again. One of the ancient ways that people tried to make things right, like baking banana bread or taking someone out to dinner is, is sacrifice. A sacrifice, you, you offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving when the 
crops would be brought in. They'd give the first fruits of the of the of the take of the harvest back to the temple for God to say thank you. And then another thing that they would do is when they had sinned, they would they would offer a sacrifice in in reparation for that sin. Now you've heard of the phrase scapegoat. It's because ritually they would take a goat and put their sins on it and run the goat out to die in the desert. The goat would be the one to take the, to take the licks for everyone else. But imagine, for example, if you go went back and you hurt your friend and you came back and you said, you know, I'm so sorry that I hurt you. I killed a squirrel for you. <laughs> what would you do? You'd be like freaked out. You'd say, that's not going to do it. Except it's, and God continually says throughout the prophets and throughout the Old Testament, he says, it's not the blood of goats and bulls I want. It's your heart. It's your heart. So now go back to this fundamental question. How are we ever going to make the repair? It has to be on behalf of humanity. We all suffer from this and we're all participating. We're all trying at times to be God. How are we ever going to make that sacrifice to God? which really does, does make up and repair and save us. Well, God had a solution. You know what that solution is? Or I should say, you know who that solution was? God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, born of a woman. You see, when the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and, and the angel said that you will be the mother of the Most High. She says, yes, I'll do it. Let it be done according to your word. Right then and there, Jesus started as a zygote, as like little anybody cells, like you and me. And, and he got uh, bigger and grew and grew and then was born at Christmas time. You see, he accepted full humanity without surrendering his divinity. But as Paul tells us in, in Philippians, though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not deem equality with God. Rather, he emptied himself. This emptying himself is to allow his humanity so that he could learn what it was like to be a, a little boy and play soccer with his friends and do all these things, learn how to read and write and be carpentry with his father. That he enters fully into, human being, into the human state without sin. And the reason he was not, was without sin is because his human will and his divine will were perfectly aligned. They were separate. He had two, he was both God and man, but perfectly aligned. And that's what brings us peace is when we just line ourselves up with God. But then we see that he takes all the hatred, all the up grudges and all of our nastiness. He takes our desire to try and be God. He takes our all the sins of humanity. He takes even the most disastrous effect of sin itself, which is death, and he nails it to a cross. He nails it to a cross and he takes that and transforms it into new life, into healing and forgiveness. Where there's hatred, he sows love. Where there's injury, he brings pardon, as St. Francis tells us. And it's, so it's in Jesus is the one who was the answer to that original question. The question was, how are we ever going to bridge the gap that we built between us and God? I mean, just think of that. Think it's like when we broke away with God and even time when we, everything we did, we just created a deeper and deeper and deeper chasm. And imagine God way over there and we're over here. And, and there's this, this huge morass that we cannot cross. And then all of a sudden Jesus comes and in his humanity enters into our condition and with his divinity is the bridge that brings us in. So when Jesus ascends to heaven, our human nature goes into heaven itself. And the power of this is that when he baptized, when we were baptized, he said, go out and baptize all nations. When we were baptized, we were made part of Jesus. So it's not like we're like, oh, thanks, Jesus, you're way over there. No, we are part of his mystical body. We are his hands and his smile and his feet and, and his kindness and his, all that he's asking us to be as part of his, of his mission to help save the world. We're brought into that. But it also means that 
that God then becomes not just indwelling, but we become dwelling in God. So from that first moment when we're, when we're lost and ashamed and hating ourselves, there was suddenly an incompleteness to our life because we had separated ourselves from God. And we think about that incompleteness all the time. We look in the mirror and we're like, ugh. They think, oh, maybe if I just got new shoes, or maybe if I did that, or I got a facelift, or something like that, or if I just could get a little more money, if I could get a little more money. It's like John Rockwell, they said, made billions and billions, and they said, how much is enough? And he said, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. You hear that? And we all feel that need, because life is inherently incomplete. Because we're not made for here. It's like when someone dies, the reason we're sad is not just because we're going to miss them, but also it sort of exposes that incompleteness because they're gone. But then we realize, wait a second, the completeness is found in heaven and in God. And then Jesus comes and dwells in our hearts and we realize that we can start experiencing that right now. That's how we can make this bold, audacious claim that Jesus is the source of abundant life the source. And so it's important to remember that Jesus didn't come to give us a set of ethical principles like, oh, here's a list, do this, follow this thing, and you will know happiness. No, he came to bring us himself. He came to bring us this source so that in fact, an experience of God, an experience of, of faith is an encounter with a person who is both divine and human but entered into my humanity in such a way that he knows that broken heart. He knows that the, the yearnings for, for, for what uh, we all desire. But in his divinity came to bring us into that, which is the source, which fills that hunger, which brings us the answers to the questions of all of our lives. So that's how we can say it, my brothers and sisters. Jesus is the source of abundant life. Amen.